When we discussed the evolution of antibiotic resistance, we saw that strong selection very rapidly produced a, an evolution of resistance. The same thing happens in cancer. There are lots of analogies between the evolution of resistance to antibiotics and the evolutions of, of resistance to chemotherapy. We're now going to explore that and see whether or not there is anything we can do by understanding cancer as an evolutionary process to try to slow down the rate at which resistance evolution occurs and thereby extend the period of health and life for cancer patients. As with antibiotic resistance, chemotherapy very rapidly selects for resistant clones. That's the same principle we've seen with bacteria. There are several alternatives to chemotherapy that are being explored. One is targeted immunotherapy, which is more or less the production of a magic bullet through evolutionary means. Another is adaptive therapy. Don't nuke it, farm it. So we will see how both of those work. Treating cancer is kind of like treating a worm infection. You're dealing with eukaryotic cells, except in this case, they are the patient's cells. So you're trying to kill the cancer without killing the patient. The more drug, the stronger the effect. That gives us a dose response curve. So this might be the biological effect here, the dose dependent effect of a cytotoxic agent or perhaps of a tumor promoter. And this is dose here on the x-axis. So mutagens normally just have a linear increase in their mutagenic capacity with dose. But often a drug will have a period of a, a dose at which it's ineffective and then a rapid transition to a point where it's quite effective. And it would be here that you'd be worried about not only killing the tumor but also killing the patient. Normally, uh, in a phase one clinical trial, that is just to check what should be the dose that we give. In other words, can we give a dose that won't in and of itself harm the patient? Then in a, in a phase two clinical trial, you might see a hint that the drug is effective. And in a phase three clinical trial, that is a more elaborate trial. It's a randomized placebo controlled test. It's expensive. And with cancer chemotherapy, success is usually now defined as extending life by a few months. So success is usually rather modest. The question is, can we do better than this diagram? Here you see a heterogeneous set of clones in a cancer. Therapy is applied. That selects a resistant clone. The resistant clone expands, and it begins to send off subclones, so it starts becoming genetically heterogeneous again. If we come back and we hit it with therapy again, it has enough genetic variation in it so that some cells in it will be resistant, and that process repeats. We need therapies that can account for the evolution of tumor cells. Here's a typical clinical experience. Patient arrives in the clinic, it's got, he's got late stage cancer, it's metastasized, it's throughout the body. Surgery is thought to be ineffective. There's too many metastases and too many kinds of tissue and they're too small, some of them. So a cytotoxic chemotherapy is started, say once a week for three weeks. It's attacking all of the proliferating cells in the body. The patient's hair falls out. The gut lining sloughs off. The poor person feels sick as hell. The tumor shrinks. It might even disappear from a scan or an x-ray. But note that a mass of one million cells is too small to be visible in an MRI. So it might shrink. It might look like things are OK. But there could be small surviving resistant clones scattered all over the body. A few months later, the tumor reappears somewhere. Application of the same drug doesn't work anymore. This is a resistant clone. So they try a different drug. The process repeats. This is exactly how a uh, scientist, a basic scientist, would select for resistance in the lab. In other words, the standard chemotherapy is probably just about as efficient a way of selecting for resistance as possible. 
Now, there are different kinds of chemotherapy. Cytotoxins are doing things like blocking DNA synthesis or binding to DNA and causing problems with apoptosis. Targeted therapies are things that are for specific cancers. Gleevec is for breast cancer. Tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor that's also for breast cancer. And gefitinib is blocking epithelial growth factor receptor. So those are more specific kinds of therapies. Those are some of the sorts of chemical actions that are involved in chemotherapy. These therapies select cells that have resistant mutations. So those resistant mutations are now pretty well characterized for each of these therapies. We know that for Gleevec, resistance can arise by a point mutation in the pocket where Gleevec is binding to uh, BCR. It, sometimes the mutation is even present before therapy. So that would be an example where resistance was there before the chemical was ever applied. For gefitinib, we know that there are particular mutations that give resistance. And we know that the same is true for 5-fluorouracil, where it's extra copies of a particular gene. So the point of this is that, yes, we have a fair amount of information on exactly what mechanisms are being mutated to create resistance. The result of this, basically, is that cancer prevention fails in smokers who are getting a lot of mutations and fails in late stage tumors, which are genetically quite heterogeneous. One possibility is immune therapy. The immune system itself can be used to target cancer cells. And I've listed here three recent papers. Also, there have been multiple recent filings for cancer immunotherapy in the US Patent Office. I suggest that you go and take a look at these. Basically, what's going on here is that immune cells are being taken out of the body and they are being selected to be the ones that attack a particular tumor and that immune clone is being magnified so that a great deal of immunoglobulin can be produced to inject back into the patient. This is starting to show some promise. Now, in thinking about uh, the sorts of immune pathways that might be involved, there are actually many. The interactions in the immune system with cancers are complicated. And in the tumor microenvironment, there are both inhibitory and stimulatory pathways that can be targeted by either antibodies or by drugs. So the blue is a tumor cell. This is either a dendritic cell or a macrophage. This is a T regulatory cell. This is a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. This is a myeloid immunosuppressive cell. This is the cell that would be effective in anti-tumor activity. And so you want to upregulate it to attack that cell. So with that kind of background understanding on the network of communication, one could steer the research strategy to try to upregulate this interaction. There are also evolutionary approaches that can be used. For example, as a list now, a more comprehensive list, one can try to prevent the initiation of the cancer. One can combine drugs that require different mechanisms. So drug cocktails, as are used for HIV therapy, are one way to go. Unfortunately, uh, the drug cocktails can also have combined side effects, so it's not clear that the patient can tolerate them. Then one can try to slow down somatic evolution to prevent cancer and to delay relapse, and that's a function of thinking about the basic science of evolution. How big is the population? What's the mutation rate? What's the generation time? What's the clonal expansion rate? If we could measure those parameters, we would start to get a handle, just as we did in the previous slide, on the basic science of the immune system, on the basic science of cancer evolution. This is here the effect of the size of a loss of heterozygosity P53 clone on pro progression to cancer. And basically, this is a case in which at least population size 
could be measured, and it was shown that the bigger the population, the more, the more rapid the progression to malignancy. So that gives you some idea of the sorts of basic things that really haven't been measured yet for most cancers that we need to measure to really understand evolutionary approaches to therapy. Another way is to reduce the fitness differential between sensitive and resistant cells. So we can use cytostatic drugs, so slow down the cell cycle, and that reduces the mutation rate. We can prevent proximate causes of morbidity and mortality. So for example, we can keep people from losing a lot of weight by having good diet and uh, other methods of maintaining weight in patients. We can do adaptive therapy to prevent tumor growth. We'll go into that in a bit more detail. We can target public goods. What is meant by that basically is that the tumor cells are producing signaling molecules and we can target things that tumor cells are producing that are promoting tumor growth. And we can d disrupt cooperation within the tumor. So these are more or less game theoretic approaches to tumor control. We're going to take a little bit better look at preventing tumor growth with adaptive therapy. We can also select for benign cells, we can use benign cell boosters, and we can select for chemosensitivity. By selecting for benign cells, basically we are helping the cells that are competing with the malignant cells that doesn't get rid of the malignant cells, but it more or less holds them under control. So let's take a look at adaptive therapy. This is Bob Gattenby's idea, and it's in some ways rather compelling. The idea basically is that what you want to do is not give too large a dose. This is the mean tumor burden on the y-axis and days after cell injection in a mouse model of cancer. So if you don't do anything, those are the control animals, and they very rapidly get a lot of tumor. If you give a standard high dose, what happens of chemotherapy, what happens is that the tumor starts, it collapses, then selection for resistance occurs, and then it grows again. So that's what happens with chemotherapy at standard high dose. If you give adaptive therapy. That means you give the chemotherapy, but you adjust it to as low a dose as possible that keeps the cancer under control. This is the result here. So these are two different experiments, and basically in both of them, what you see is that the adaptive therapy is allowing the mice to survive much longer. Okay? It's keeping the tumor burden low, but it's not wiping it out. And by doing that, it's not selecting strongly for resistance. It is also now possible, using things like modern sequencing methods, to individualize treatment. This is a case we're looking at here in which there is traditional chemotherapy, but it's been informed with detailed genetic information. So you can see that the patient comes in, there is a biopsy, the patient uh, probably has surgery to remove the primary lesion, chemotherapy is applied. During that time, the biopsy goes through molecular pathology and through next generation sequencing that will give information on multiple regions of the cancer and the particular kinds of susceptibility that the different parts of that phylogenetic tree of cancer cells have. That allows intervention with combinational therapy and stratified medicine. The same thing can probably be done even better with targeted immune therapy. Targeted immune therapy doesn't have the side effects of chemotherapy and it can work almost like a magic bullet. So far, sometimes it works beautifully, sometimes it doesn't work. So to summarize, resistance to chemotherapy evolves rapidly, especially when chemotherapy is given in large doses. Lifespan could be extended with alternative therapies. Immunotherapy shows some promise. In some cases, it's been almost miraculous. In others, it's failed. Adaptive therapy, 
where you are regulating the amount and farming the tumor rather than killing it seems to work in mice. But this idea will be hard for some to accept. If you have a cancer, you probably just naturally want to hit it as hard as possible. And it's difficult to accept that you might actually be able to extend your life and your period of seeming well-being if you didn't take quite as strong a chemotherapy. Individualized therapy with or without immunotherapy is now possible, but certainly at this point it is not cheap. It can cost tens of thousands of dollars, and that has implications for health policy. We either have to work at making the technology much cheaper, or we have to think seriously about the morality of generating ever more expensive therapies that are not accessible to much of the population.